Thank you, Seth. Seth didn't mention that his mom had a health incident uh, this week. She's rebounded apparently nicely, but I'm sure they'd appreciate your continued prayers for Seth's mother. Uh, I want to say something about Andy Harvey. I recognize that many of you most don't know uh, Andy, but Andy was a fixture at this church, Andy and Janet, and uh, he has come back occasionally over the years. They live way up in Salina. If you know anything about Salina, it's it's up there a ways, uh, but uh, Andy was a, a faithful follower of Jesus. He was larger than life in so many ways, and um, uh, his obituary this morning, I was reading it, uh, one of his telltale lines was, how did I do? <laughs> so uh, that's the kind of person he was. But uh, he, he died suddenly, so it's quite a shock to his family. So please keep uh, Janet and uh, the family in your prayers. Well, the passage I've chosen uh, for our reading and consideration this morning is found in Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 19. So if you'd Uh, Take your Bibles and turn to Luke 16. We'll begin reading in verse 19. It's the story of the rich man and Lazarus, a story I'm uh, quite sure most of you uh, are familiar with. And so an opportunity to think anew about its primary message. And also I hope to understand the circumstances which led to the Lord uh, relating the story. We've been studying the Gospel of Luke in the adult Sunday school class, and so those who attend that class are aware of the occasion that led up to this moment. Jesus has been primarily addressing the notorious Pharisee uh, leaders, uh, specifically in this context, about their disgraceful attitude toward wealth and the love of money. He has not condemned wealth per se, uh, but rather encouraged the proper attitude toward it. He had referred to it in the verses above our passage in the parable of the unrighteous steward, uh, urging in the ninth verse, a difficult verse, but urging there that people ought to use the wealth of this world, what he calls worldly wealth, in generous ways so that they'll make friends uh, with their money, that, and with these people who will one day uh, welcome, Jesus said, them into the eternal dwellings. But because the Pharisees were lovers of money, as you see in verse 14, they only scoffed at Jesus. So now the Lord turns in verse 19 to this story conveying how perilous that attitude will prove. So let's read it together. Uh, Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate, covered with sores, and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Uh, Besides, uh, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things, but now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony." And besides all this, worse of all, we might say, worse of all, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able and that none may cross over from there to us. 
And he said, then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers in order that he may warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and our time together in it. Let's bow together in prayer. There's some debate whether the episode Jesus describes in Luke 16 of the rich man and Lazarus is a true story uh, known only to him or yet another parable he chose to tell. That's really an academic uh, question that I've chosen not to touch on this morning. Uh, So we can hear the story today as the Pharisees and the crowd about them heard it then. A powerful message conveying urgent self-examination. Is there any story in the Bible more stirring or disturbing? It's the only description we have from the Word of God of a person actually suffering in hell with all the alarming attributes of an experience to be avoided at all costs, fiery agony without end, complete aloneness, hopelessness, searing regret, and gut-wrenching grief, only worsened by the never-ending consciousness of an alternate eternity of paradise that was once there for the taking. You may have heard of the epitaph written on a certain tombstone. Remember, friend, as you pass by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, soon you shall be. Prepare for death and follow me. It's the story of a rich man and a poor man. The poor man's name was Lazarus a name that befit his ultimate destiny. The name was derived from the word Eleazar, which means God has helped. The rich man's name is not given, though tradition has given him the name Debus, Latin for rich. When you see it spelled out, it looks like dives. It's pronounced Debus. Uh, The two men are described in the story in ways that underscore their different situations in society. As you know, the Bible does not condemn uh, wealth in and of itself. On the contrary, we find many admirable characters in the Bible who were quite wealthy. Abraham uh, was a very uh, wealthy man, as was Job, who had a fortune, lost it, and built a fortune again. Uh, Luke, the author of our gospel, was a physician, so he was likely a man of means. Uh, And in the book of Acts, he... Uh, introduced us to a couple, Priscilla and Aquila, who were wealthy enough to host a church in their home. Uh, Jesus was buried, according to prophecy, in the tomb of a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea. Just as in our own experiences, the Bible portrays a world inhabited by both the rich and the poor, and though the rich are warned, against the deceitfulness of riches and the dangers that wealth may present, the poor are never praised for their poverty, but both are to live their lives before the eyes of the living God. There are always the rich, and there are always the poor, and some of both go to heaven, and some of both go to hell. But our two protagonists are presented before us in something like a before and after perspective, uh, representing their lives as experienced in this life and then in the next life. They are described by the Lord uh, further in explicit language as if to accentuate their circumstances. The the rich man, he said, uh, habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor uh, every day 
it, it was his daily custom, you know, not just two times a year when he dressed up, it was his daily custom to wear costly purple outer garments colored that way with the dye obtained from the shellfish murex. His undergarments, I won't go into detail, but they were also the best that money could buy, made of the finest uh, linens. No Calvin Klein for this man. He had the very best. Uh, they were the clothes of royalty, uh, or at least pretend royalty. He was flamboyantly pretentious. He enjoyed a worldly Epicurean lifestyle, uh, joyously living in splendor is how my Bible has it. It, conv it conveys how he loved to eat. It was his gluttonous joy to feast regally every day. If the television program was still around, he'd be a candidate for lifestyles of the rich and famous. Maybe it is still around, I don't know. I'm pretty sure that man with the accent is not around. He was completely self-indulgent, as becomes apparent in verse 20 with the description of the poor man, Lazarus, who is deliberately contrasted with the rich man. The two of them, we might say, are commingled in our Lord's telling. Lazarus was poor financially, yes, but he was also severely downtrodden physically. He was afflicted with something like ulcerated sores that festered and would not go away. Uh, some malady had crippled him so that he had to be laid uh, at the rich man's gate. Another detail, by the way, adding to the rich man's reputation, he had his own gate. Maybe some of you have your own gate, too. And he was perpetually hungry, longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Uh, the idea being that while he greatly desired the scraps that might fall from the table, he by no means... Uh, received it from his hands, only that he wished he might have been able to. <clears throat> Jeremiah, the 20th century Lutheran scholar who was an expert in Near Eastern customs, uh, discovered in the etiquette of the day in which eating utensils were not available. I think some of your, some of you children maybe ignore those eating utensils also, but. <laughs> Uh, he, he discovered that it was normal for pieces of bread uh, to be used to sop up the food's uh, residue or oil from one's fingers. And then at the end of the meal, and I don't recommend this practice, but the scraps of bread then would be thrown under the table for domesticated dogs or thrown outside on the streets for the wild dogs that roam the streets of Jerusalem. And that only made the poor man's condition worse as the dogs uh, loitered around the rich man's gate and made the helpless Lazarus sores their appetizers. But this all must have been a hidden blessing to <clears throat> Lazarus, as is often the case in our own lives when calamity or testing comes our way. There may have seemed no one to help poor Lazarus, just perhaps you, in your time of great need, seem to be alone in your heartache, but that would have forced him to seek his solace in God, the true source of relief, while Lazarus remained uh, poor and suffering in his temporal existence, he grew closer and closer spiritually to God. All the while, the rich man was being tested in a way he knew not. And this was a major point in Jesus' story. The situation outside his gate with Lazarus was his great opportunity uh, to show pity uh, to one less fortunate than he. Only he had no vision for it, so preoccupied was he with pursuing his own pleasures. The rich man could have insisted the scraps be swept up and, and taken outside to, to this poor man. And we, found, we find out later he knew his name. He, he knew it was Lazarus out there. 
passing by him daily as he went about his business in compassion, uh, doing the very least he could have done, but he couldn't even do that, for the thought never interfered with his self-indulgent pleasures. Rich man, poor man. That's a dichotomy that has stood since the beginning of time. Uh, Dickens wrote about it. Uh, Jane Eyre epitomized it. Uh, the greatest minds have made that enormous divide the object of their deepest study. Why, even the icons of rock and roll found a way to make it their lead in. Once upon a time, you dressed so fine through the bums of dime, didn't you? Beavis wouldn't even throw the poor man a dime. He was invisible to him. The Apostle John warned the readers of his first epistle in 1 John 3, 17, whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? And James echoed the sentiment in his epistle in James 2, 15. Uh, what good is a person's so-called faith, he asked, if he sees a brother or sister in desperate need, yet has only empty words to give and, and not actually the food and clothing that will nourish and warm them. The Pharisees listening to Jesus had a faith, but it was an empty faith. Unlike the Sadducees with whom they're often compared, uh, their belief in a future life and a coming judgment was good Theology in it, in conformity with the scriptures, described a few verses down as Moses and the prophets. But they ignored their professed beliefs, the Pharisees did, and poured their energies instead into increasing their wealth. Jesus was only this far into his story when they realized it was aimed at them again. He had just told them in uh, verse 15 of our chapter, look there, you, you are those, he said, who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is de detestable in the sight of God. Strong words, but the rich man in the story fit the bill. And the Pharisees knew Jesus intended him to represent them. Well, the next and decisive stage of the story comes in verse 22 with the inevitable death of the two men, for both did die, and uh, death will bring about a change in lifestyle for sure. Uh, here is the massive reversal of fortune that is one of the great themes of, of Jesus' story. Uh, the matter-of-fact way in which the Lord chronicles the new uh, situation supports the old adage of George Bernard Shaw, who observed that the statistics on death are quite impressive. Every one out of one dies. Jesus says, now the poor man died. He was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. <coughs> Death is the great divider. Things are going to be different now than then, just as they will be strictly different there than here. Uh, the rich man's riches will suddenly vanish and his true poverty be revealed, and poor Lazarus's true riches will replace his earthly poverty. James Montgomery Boyce, in his book on the parables of Jesus, reduced the new circumstances to this. Here we have a poor rich man growing poorer and a rich poor man growing richer. Death is the great revealer. It levels the playing field to allow grace and judgment to be brought to bear. To this point, nothing has been said explicitly about Lazarus's spiritual condition, and we could only surmise that the rich man's, what the rich man's spiritual state was. 
And that, that's how it is in this life. We are uh, rightly uh, reluctant to pronounce verdicts of heaven or hell willy-nilly upon people because there's always the possibility that we misidentify uh, one from another because of either small but carnal faith on the one hand or rank hypocrisy on, on the other. But death reveals the true spiritual condition of every person. The language we find in the Bible describing the experience of heaven and hell is invariably figurative. We've learned this from this pulpit from Dan uh, many times. We get into the afterlife and eschatology. The language is figurative. It, it's uh, impossible to fully and accurately describe the bliss of heaven and the agonizing suffering uh, in hell. And so uh, J both Jesus, who spoke of hell more than anyone else in the scriptures, and the other biblical writers under the leading of the Holy Spirit, were always left with resorting to symbolic language. In verse 22, uh, the poor man is said to have died and been carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, while here, quite prosaically, the rich man is said to have also died and was buried. Nothing is said about a burial for poor Lazarus. Uh, Lazarus had no renown or reputation that would have brought wide notice. He left no estate from which a burial could be uh, provided. His loathsome body, once discovered, was likely carried away by the same people who used to carry him to the gate of the rich man and unceremoniously dumped uh, into the trash heap in the Valley of Hinnom or Gehenna, located, located outside the city's uh, walls, the resting place of criminals and the indigent and uh, the place that uh, over time became a symbol for hell itself. That's where his body likely ended up, the poor man, but his soul, well, that was another thing altogether. Uh, the place where Lazarus himself went in full consciousness is described by Jesus as being carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, ignored by the rich man and his companions in life. He was not ignored by God when his earthly life ended. Rather, he was lovingly transported by God's emissaries into the comforting place at the side of Abraham in paradise. Like the place of honor at a heavenly banquet where he began his stint in eternity at rest, serene, and eating his fill at the messianic table. The image is of the loving and divine care of God lavished upon him. But about uh, the rich man, the Lord simply noted that he died and was buried. Uh, perhaps, perhaps there was a, a grand funeral for him. Uh, some speculate that that would have been uh, the case because that is the way of the world, isn't it? Um, to mark with fanfare the departure from our world of someone deemed very important. But that's for those left behind, isn't it? We go to these funerals, we go to these services, it's meant for us, not for the person who has died. We're soon reminded of that. But at this point, I think it's possible that the Lord paused and let that last clause hang in the air. He died and he was buried. Verse 22, it's a short verse, but it contains a meaningful contrast, to borrow a phrase. One person dies and no burial is mentioned, but we're told of the continuation of his life. The other man receives a burial, but nothing is said about his soul. Until Jesus continues in verse 23, in Hades, this once rich man lifted up his eyes being in torment and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. 
we could conduct a word study on that descriptive Greek term, Hades. I won't take the time, but the important thing to know is that while it was used generally for the abode of the dead, uh, and in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, specifically to translate the Hebrew Sheol, a word describing the realm of the dead, including both the wicked and the righteous, in the New Testament, it was always used for the place where the wicked dwelt prior to their final judgment. In the New Testament, there are no believers in Hades. So we'd be wise to consider Hades here in verse 22 as hell, in contrast to heaven. The Lord had already used it that way in Luke's 10th chapter, Luke chapter 10, verse 15, you'll remember this without looking it up. He condemned the city of Capernaum by saying they would not be exalted to heaven, but you'll be brought down to Hades. What a shock it must be for the souls of men and women who have lived their lives in the mistaken belief that there are no consequences to their sin and the refusal to accept the free offer of forgiveness of sin and, and eternity in the bliss of heaven provided for all sinners in the life and sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. The offer is free and available by faith alone in him and in his finished work. It was only now that the rich man suddenly learned of what true riches and true poverty consist. The riches are to be found ultimately in God and in God alone. What a shock to find himself now in hell. It was surely a shock to the Pharisees as well as they continued to listen. It was, it was the common belief at the time that wealth was a sure sign of God's blessing. Uh, so to hear this sudden twist in the story in which the wealthy man ended up in hell while the poor, insignificant man received the blessings of God in heaven would have jolted their sense of prideful complacency. Several years ago, Dr. Johnson was speaking here. Uh, I don't remember the series, though I wrote this down, but he cited a survey, a survey that had been conducted in which you're sick of surveys, aren't you? But still, he cited a, surf, a survey a long time ago uh, th that had been conducted in which only one in 25 Minnesotans believed he deserved to go to hell. But five times as many knew someone else who did deserve to go to hell. I think that was about how the Pharisees were feeling at this moment, but no one dared speak out against Jesus as he continued. I don't know if at that moment the rich man in the story could actually see Lazarus in Abraham's bosom, or if this was merely, again, the kind of figurative language that is meant to communicate important truth in understandable terms. The scriptures do speak of God's face, his arm, his eyes. Although God, the scriptures also say his spirit, he's not a corporeal being. Here we see Father Abraham embracing Lazarus in heaven while the rich man looks on and pleads. There's fire, there's thirst a request for a finger to be dipped in water and placed on the tongue. Literal or not, the story means at the very least that when one dies, he is aware of both heaven and hell, and he knows there is an impassable gulf between the two, and if he is in hell, he will fervently desire to reverse course then and instead be in heaven. Some people listening to a sermon on hell will object. Are you saying my parents are in hell? 
And the response to that would be, I don't know if your parents are in hell or not, but if they are, they would not want you to join them there. So having seen the ecstasy, now arrives the sad agony as the rich man cries out in verse 24, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. Everything is different now. Uh, But in a strangely sad way, the rich man is unchanged. Uh, He who had never shown mercy himself when he had opportunity now pleads for mercy, but it's mercy for himself. It's still in his own interest, and his attitude toward Lazarus is unchanged. Now he notices him at least, but only as a servant boy who imagines he can commandeer to leave his place of repose to run errands for him. He imagines himself on a completely different level. Father Abraham, show a little mercy here. Look, Lazarus is handy. Send him to do me a favor. In the story, Jesus had already described the rich man as in torment. That word doesn't need a lot of explanation, I'm afraid, but three circumstances must have accentuated the torment. One, the fact that he likely instantly recognized it was a torment he would endure forever, for he never asked that it be taken away, only that he received some minor relief. Secondly, that he was able to vividly see Lazarus and realize the blessed state that he was in. And lastly, that he knew he was to face it absolutely alone. Now, however, we learn even more, he is in agony in this flame. Fire and brimstone are perhaps the most common horrors of hell cited when people speak of it, sometimes mockingly and other times dramatically. Most importantly, it's a biblical expression representing God's punishment of sin and sinners. It's found several times in the book of Revelation to represent the horrors of the final state in hell and tellingly, in Revelation 20:10 of Satan's final and everlasting judge punishment, it reads, "And the devil who deceived him them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever." No one enjoys speaking of the horrors of hell. I know I don't but it is the plain teaching of the Word of God and part of His plan, and His plan is perfect. There have always been those who are so appalled by the idea that they simply choose to conjure ideas that will ease the horror. Uh, Annihilation, for example, is one. God's going to punish the wicked, but after a certain time, He'll simply annihilate them. I understand that sentiment. Maybe you do, too. It eases the horror of thinking about hell, but the scriptures don't support it. Uh, Some of you have been reading through the Bible this year, and it wasn't too long ago you read the last chapter of the 66 books of the prophet uh, Isaiah, and the last verse says, Then they will go forth and look on the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me, for their worm will not die, and their fire will not be quenched, and they will be in abhorrence to all mankind. The story of Lazarus and the rich man is an illustration of why it's so important to heed God's word now while you have the opportunity. And that's really the essence of Abraham's mournful response to the rich man in verses 25 and 26. I've entitled them in my outline, Then and Now, Here and There. Abraham said, child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus bad things, but now he's being comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between you, us and you, there is a great chasm fixed, so that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. Uh, The the chasm pictures for us the utter and unchangeable finality of the decisions the rich man had made. 
and the consequences for him with absolutely no possibility of change. The chasm is fixed, is how Abraham puts it. For the saved, there is, is and always will be the here of heaven and the there of hell, and there's no crossing over uh, from one to the other. What a terrible irony. Good things. They may have seemed good at the time, but in this new environment, they had to have seemed revolting. Abraham knows the truth, and he wills it subtly. They were your good things, your good things. They were what the rich man had chosen in life. What were they? They were the things that made him comfortable then, the possessions that made him proud then, the worldly prestige he accumulated then. They were all his good things, but as it turned out, and as he had been warned, they were all ephemeral, like a spray mist that vanishes in the air, and now they were useless to him. Lazarus had not possessed such good things. He had bad things, and it's important to notice that Abraham doesn't say it was his bad things. They were his lot in life, the provinces uh, God gave him then and there, but now here he was being comforted. The application is obvious. W.G.T. Shedd, the great Presbyterian theologian, summarized it this way. No man can have his good things, his chief pleasures, in both worlds. There is no alchemy that can amalgamate substances that refuse to mix. No man has ever yet succeeded. No man ever will succeed in securing both the pleasures of sin and the pleasures of holiness in living the life of Debus and then going to the bosom of Abraham. And that doesn't mean, and we've made the point already, that there are not material blessings to be had in this world. God does allow an allotment for some. Lewis talked about pleasant ends along the way, but we must not confuse them for home. So every person must make his choice, she had went on to say, whether he will have his good things now or hereafter. Uh, every person is making his choice. The heart is now set either upon God or upon the world, and it's the duty and the wisdom of every person to let this world go and seek his good things in the hereafter. Because the two destinies are irreversible. What Lazarus was temporally Abraham explained gently, you are eternally miserable. And now we come to the living and the word of God, the final verses, that's the content. The, the story has traveled from the living to the dead in the next world, but now the rich man's thoughts return to the land of the living. He's got five brothers who are still alive and so for the first time, he, he shows some interest on someone other than himself. So he, he begs Abraham to send Lazarus now to them. See, there's no sanctification in hell. He's still got the same attitude to Lazarus and he did, as he did before. He's his errand boy. But he desires that Lazarus go back. Of course he wants him to go back. Leave the comfort he had never known before so that he could go to the rich man's brothers and, and warn them against their current course of living. His thinking is that if they can just be told by a supernatural appearance from the dead that their present way of life will result in the kind of torment that he's enduring, they'll reform their ways. Uh, perhaps he also felt he'd been treated unfairly himself because he didn't have such a thing happen to him. But Abraham responds in verse 29, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Abraham was referencing the entire corpus of, of Scripture when he said Moses and the prophets. The Scriptures are sufficient to guide one's conduct and to reveal the path to the kind of relationship with God that Lazarus obviously had embraced. They were full. The scriptures, well, you know this. The scriptures were full of admonitions from God, warning against the attitude and the conduct of the rich man. Uh, Micah 6, 8, 
uh, is only one, but it's noteworthy, and you know it, so I chose it. He has told you, O oh man. He has told you what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Of course, there are many, many other verses. But here, the rich man, this is very interesting. The rich man knows from personal experience how he himself had responded to such admonitions. And he knew, too, his family. He knew that the rest of his family did not take seriously what the scriptures said. Something more is needed, he insists in verse 30, like a visitor from the dead. But Abraham refuses his request. Do you know why? Because it won't work. By the time Luke wrote his gospel, his readers, we're his readers today, but he had early readers. By the time he wrote his gospel, they would have known that. Uh, there was another man named Lazarus, not this one, another one. He had actually been Jesus' good friend, you know this. He died, and Jesus brought him back to life from the dead. And the, the very thing the rich man is, is asking for. And far from being the miraculous sign that brought people like the rich man's brothers to their senses and to repentance, it was the miracle that sealed the Lord's death. You can go back to John 11 and read it. Some believed, yes, but the significant thing was that the very same Pharisees listening to him now would take counsel and plan together to kill him. His readers would have also recalled Jesus' own resurrection from the dead and hardened hearts that refused to believe even in the light of it. So the rich man's final plea was rejected because it wouldn't work. But also, sadly, because it was too late. The time for him to make responsible decisions and have an impact on others was past. His good things in life had so distracted him. He left no room, no time for the primary things, the glory of God and the state of his soul. He had thought the life of good things was all there was, so he directed his life to that. The use we make of our worldly wealth God gives us and of the time he blesses us with reveal where our heart is. That's where our heart is. The rich man's situation was hopeless because he had died. And now he was receiving his just reward. Before, he had hope. But now, hope was gone. But not for you, friends, listening. You are alive and hearing the word of God. And you have the opportunity to choose heaven over hell. To place your trust in Jesus Christ who died to bear the sins, or the penalty for the sins of sinners so that the death that he died to sin might cover your death as well. It's not too late for you. There's hope for you. By God's grace, you can choose Christ today and one day find your comfort and rest in the bosom of Abraham, just like our man Lazarus. Choose Christ. Choose heaven. This life is not all there is. Well, we're going to sing a hymn. I remembered. <laughs> Hard to teach an old dog new tricks, but... It's hymn 13 in the Songs of Praise. Please stand and we'll sing it. Lord, we are so grateful for your goodness to us. We thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit to illumine us, to call us to yourself, to give us new life so that we might have eyes to see and ears uh, to hear. And uh, Lord, we uh, are mindful that 
Uh, there are two types of people in the world, those whose hearts you open and those who remain in their sin and will not bow their knee to you. And we pray for them that they will heed uh, the promptings of your spirit to listen to the scriptures and find healing, find the promise of forgiveness and eternal life in Christ. Now to him who is able to do more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen.